The subject of today's session is admittedly one of the more troubling passages in Genesis. Genesis chapter 27. What's troubling is not simply that we find ourselves confronting a story that portrays people doing what seems at the very least, to put it mildly, not right. Unfortunately, there are a lot of such episodes in Genesis, but that the people involved who are behaving in this manner are our Holy Father, and our Holy Mother, Jacob, and his mother, Rebecca, in what reads very jarringly as the deceit in which Isaac is deceived into giving to Jacob the blessing intended for Esau. Let's begin at the very least with the highlights of chapter 27. You have it in your Bibles. We're not going to be reading the entire chapter within because of the limitations of time. But let's consider what this passage has to convey to us. Chapter 27 begins, And it came to pass when Isaac was old, his eyes were dim, so he could not see. Of course, his inability to see plays a critical role in the story. And he called Esau, his elder son, and said to him, My son, and the summons is, I'm old, I know not the day of my death. Go out and hunt game for me. Make me savory food, such as I love. Bring it to me that I may eat, that my soul may bless you before I die. Well, in verse 5, we read that Rebekah heard when Isaac spoke to Esau. And when Esau went to the field to hunt, Rebekah calls Jacob, her son, and tells him what is about to happen and gives him very clear instructions. Therefore, my son, hearken to my voice according to that which I command you. Go now to the flock and fetch me from there two good kids of the goats, and I will make them a savory food for your father such as he loves, and you will bring it to your father that he may eat, so that he may bless you before his death. Rebecca clearly perceives in this blessing something of critical significance, perhaps most aptly indicated in the manner in which she paraphrases what Isaac says to Esau in Rebecca's version, bring me game and make me a savory food that I may eat and bless you before God, before my death. Well, I didn't, Zik didn't say it was before God. Maybe out of humility. But Rebecca does. This is a blessing that's before God. And you need to be the one, Jacob, to receive it. One way or the other. Now, it is, of course, significant that Jacob is not a particularly enthusiastic accomplice. That is, when in verses 11 and 12, noting that Esau is a hairy man and he is smooth, and that if my father feels me, I will seem to him a deceiver and bring a curse upon me and not a blessing. He seems to be hinting at his mother that this isn't really the right way to be acting, but Rebecca is adamant, upon me be your curse. This is what you must do. Hearken to my voice, 
go fetch me them. And the story unfolds. He went, fetched, brought them to his mother. His mother made savory food, such as his father loved. Rebecca took the choicest garments of Esau, which were with her in the house. Interesting. Esau has two wives, but his choicest garments he left with his mother. And put them upon Jacob, her younger son. And she put the skins of the kids of the goats upon his hands and upon the smooth of his neck and gave the savory food and the bread which she had prepared into the hand of her son Jacob. And Jacob goes to Isaac, My father, here I am. Who are you? I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done according as you spoke to me. Arise, I pray, sit and eat of my game, that your soul may bless me. And the dialogue between them continues to skip to the bottom line, as it were, while Isaac discerns something unusual. The voice is the voice of Jacob, but the hands are the hands of Esau. And he discerned him not because his hands were hairy, because of the skins, as his brother's Esau's hands. So he blessed him. And he said, are you my son Esau? And he said, I am. And ultimately, we read, in verses 27, 28, and 29, the blessing. He came near and kissed him, and he smelled the smell of his raiment and blessed him and said, See, the smell of my son is as the smell of a field which God has blessed. So God give you of the dew of heaven and of the fat places of the earth and plenty of corn and wine. Let peoples serve you and nations bow down to you. Be Lord over your brethren, and let your mother's sons bow down to you. Cursed be everyone that curses you, and blessed be everyone that blesses you. And, of course, that would be the end of the story, except we've neglected what happens to Esau. And that, of course, is critical. In verse 30, and it came to pass as soon as Isaac had made an end of blessing Jacob, and Jacob was yet scarce gone out from the presence of Isaac his father, that Esau his brother came in from his hunting. And he also made savory food, brought it to his father, said to his father, let my father arise and eat of his son's game, that my soul may bless you. And here, Isaac, of course, inevitably realizes something is not right. Who are you? I am your son, your firstborn, Esau. And Isaac trembled very exceedingly and said, Who then is he that has hunted game and brought it to me, and I have eaten of all before you came and have blessed him? Yea, and he shall be blessed. Well, oh. When Esau heard the words of his father, he cried with an exceeding great and bitter cry and said unto his father, Bless me, even me also, O my father. And at this point, of course, it is perfectly clear to Isaac what has happened. Your brother came. We can render the Hebrew as with guile or with cunning, with wisdom, and has taken away your blessing. Uh, the Esau bemoans, is not he rightly named Jacob, for he has supplanted me these two times. He took away my birthright, and behold, now he has taken away my blessing. He said, have you not reserved a blessing for me? And Isaac seems unable to conjure up a blessing for Esau. Until in the wake of Esau's insistence, bless me, even me also, my father, and Esau lift up his voice and wept. 
And Isaac, his father, answered and said unto him, and we read the second blessing here in verses 39 and 40. Behold, of the fat places of the earth shall be your dwelling, and of the dew of heaven from above, and by your sword shall you live. And you shall serve your brother, and it shall come to pass, when you shall break loose, that you shall shake his yoke from off your neck. And Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing wherewith his father blessed him. And Esau said in his heart, Let the days of mourning for my father be at hand, then I will slay my brother Jacob. Well, verse 42, the words of Esau, her elder son, were told to Rebekah, and she sent and called Jacob, her younger son, and said to him, Behold, your brother Esau, concerning you, comforts himself, proposing to kill you. Now, therefore, my son, hearken to my voice, and arise, flee to Laban, my brother, to Haran, and dwell with him a few days until your brother's fury turns away. Well, those few days, as we know from the continuation of Genesis, span not a few days, but over two decades. At the end of Jacob's sojourn with Laban, he says to him, these 20 years have I been in your house. I served you 14 years for your two daughters and six years for your flock. 20 years, besides the time in transit going to and from. Over two decades in exile. I can't help but share with you that in our tradition, this theme of exile in the life of Jacob is associated with another theme of exile, a theme of exile of which we read in Numbers chapter 35 and Deuteronomy chapter 19, where the exile is punishment for a very specific crime. Taking it in Numbers 35, God speaks to Moses and commands him that once you enter the land of Canaan, in verse 11, you shall appoint cities to be cities of refuge for you, that the manslayer who smites any person through error may flee there, and the cities will be unto you for refuge from the avenger, that the manslayer not die until he stand before the congregation for judgment. And what ensues is a very detailed presentation. What constitutes deliberate murder? What constitutes inadvertent manslaughter? The punishment for deliberate premeditated murder after forewarning by witnesses is the death penalty. There is a punishment, however, for inadvertent manslaughter as well. That if he pushed the victim suddenly without enmity or hurled upon him anything without lying in wait or with any stone whereby a man may die, seeing him not, and cast it upon him so that he died and he was not his enemy, neither saw his harm, it was, after all, inadvertent. He is not to be punished, to be put to death. And as a result, in verse 25, the congregation shall deliver the manslayer out of the hand of the avenger of blood, and the congregation shall restore him to his city of refuge, where he was fled, and he shall dwell therein until the death of the high priest who was anointed with the holy oil. Now, obviously, dwelling in the city of refuge is protection. Protection, it is a city of refuge, from the blood avenger who would otherwise feel driven to exact retribution from this inadvertent manslayer 
as if he had committed a deliberate murder. But the exile is not only for the purposes of protection. It is indeed a punishment that the inadvertent murderer must endure. We read in verse 28, because he must remain in his city of refuge until the death of the high priest. But after the death of the high priest, only after the death of the high priest, the manslayer may return into the land of his possession. And these things shall be for a statute of judgment unto you throughout your generations in all your dwellings. And particularly stressing this point in verse 32, you shall take no ransom, no atonement compensation for him who is fled to his city of refuge, that he should come again to dwell in the land until the death of the priest. He must remain there. Inevitably, we can't help but ask, of what relevance is this law pertaining to the inadvertent manslayer? So the story we read in Genesis chapter 27. But then, inevitably, there is a more basic question that the whole notion of these cities of refuge necessarily elicits, and that is, why is there punishment for an unintentional act? This was not a deliberate act of murder. It was, after all, inadvertent. And on some plane, the inevitable answer, as simple as it is, is something happened here. One person died. While there wasn't any malicious intent, indeed, there was no intent at all, one can't simply ignore the reality that by dint of this act, a life was lost. Maybe you could have been more careful. Maybe you weren't sufficiently sensitive to the sanctity of life. If life is lost. There are consequences. Now returning to Genesis chapter 27. Without even addressing for the moment, what justification, if any, may have prompted Rebecca and Jacob to act as they did? For all intents and purposes, a life was lost here. That life is Esau's. Spiritually, whatever possibility, whatever potential might have existed until this moment here was extinguished. He saw from now on is going to be off the map with respect to the spiritual legacy of the household of Abraham. And that makes Jacob on some plane inevitably an inadvertent manslayer. He must a, the price. And the price is exile. Again, over two decades of exile. By contemporary standards, it's practically the equivalent of life in prison. Because there are consequences. And inevitably, it's important for us to appreciate them. Now, this realization, of course, inevitably, helps us to learn what I think we all recognize is at the very least the first stratum that we need to integrate from this story. This is, after all, on some plane, a story of crime and punishment. And we should stress the point because, of course, among 
all the literary legacy that we have from the ancient world, on this plane, the Bible is categorically unique. Indeed, even with respect to much contemporary literature as well. For a culture to indict its leaders, to sing not only their praises, but publicize their slips, their errors. The Bible does it, as we've noted, the Rabbin's teaching. And if there are lessons that we need to learn, things that we need to be taught through the wrongdoings of our greatest leaders, so be it. We need to learn the lessons. So there is undoubtedly an aspect of crime and punishment here. Not only Jacob's exile, but just consider the extent to which deceit becomes an almost never-ending presence in Jacob's life with him as the victim. In Genesis chapter 29, after Jacob comes to the household of Laban, so Laban's question in verse 15 is, what shall your wages be? And Jacob responds in verse 18, I will serve you seven years for Rachel, your younger daughter. And we read in the verses that follow of Jacob having faithfully discharged his part of the bargain. And after those seven years were over, in verse 21, Jacob said to Laban, give me my wife, for my days are filled, that I may come in with her. And Laban gathered together all the men of the place and made a feast, and it came to pass in the evening that he took Leah, his daughter, and brought her to him. Verse 25, and it came to pass in the morning that, behold, it was Leah. And he said to Laban, what is this that you have done to me? Did I not serve you for Rachel? Why have you tricked me? Why did you beguile me? And Laban said, oh, it is not so done in our place to give the younger before the firstborn. You might have said something. You had seven years to warn him. No problem. Fulfill the week of this one, and we will give you the other also for the service that you will serve with me yet another seven years. So Jacob, in order to marry his beloved Rachel, serves Laban not the seven years that had been stipulated, but 14. And of course, the deceit does not end there. In chapter 30, when the 14 years are over and Jacob wants to go back home, in verse 28, Laban says, specify for me your wages and I will give it. And Jacob, again, makes an offer, a very honest offer, an offer that indeed provides its own guarantee of his integrity. In verse 32, I will pass through all your flock today, removing from there every speckled and spotted lamb, and every brown lamb among the sheep, and the spotted and speckled among the goats, and of such will be my hire. So shall my righteousness witness against me hereafter. When you come to look over my hire that is before you, everyone that is not speckled and spotted among the goats, and brown among the sheep, that it found with me shall be counted stolen. So you'll be able to identify that my flock is indeed mine because every member of my flock will be, again, as for the sheep, the sheep that are brown, as for the goats, those that are speckled and spotted, and Laban consents, behold, would it might be according to your word, if it then in verse 35, he removed that day the he-goats that were streaked and spotted, all the she-goats that were speckled and spotted, everyone that had white in it, and all the brown ones among the sheep, and gave them into the hand of his sons. In other words, 
it wasn't simply a matter of removing the lambs so that Jacob would only be earning the lambs that would be henceforth born with the spots and the speckles and the like. It was removing all of the parents who, by any normal expectation, might be able to give rise to the spotted and speckled offspring. At this point, it would take a miracle for Jacob to earn a single lamb. And he said three days' journey between himself and Jacob, and Jacob fed the rest of Laban's flocks. Fortunately, that miracle was indeed forthcoming. We read in Genesis chapter 31, in verse 4, Jacob sent and called Rachel and Leah to the field unto his flock, and said to them, I see your father's countenance that is not toward me as before time, but the God of my father has been with me. And you know that with all my power I have served your father, and your father has mocked me and changed my wages ten times. But God suffered him not to hurt me. If he said thus, the speckled will be your wages, then all the flock were speckled. Even if they weren't any adults, that by any normal expectation could give rise to those speckled offspring. And if he said thus, the streak will be your wages, then bore all the flock streaked. And God has taken away the livestock of your father and given it to me. This is the way I've been living. Continuously subject to his deceit and his mockery. And what follows is a very poignant passage. What Rachel and Leah respond in verses 14, 15, and 16. And Rachel and Leah answered and said to him, Is there yet any portion or inheritance for us in our father's house? Are we not accounted by him strangers? For he has sold us and has also quite devoured our money. For all the riches that God has, given, has taken away from our father, that is ours and our children. Now then, whatsoever God has said unto you, do. And what's so poignant, and maybe even a little pathetic, in this whole dialogue is one gets the sense that Jacob feels compelled to defend himself to his wives because their father has been so deceitful toward him. And conversely, Rachel and Leah feel a need to demonstrate their faithful dedication to Jacob, their husband, because they realize their husband has so little confidence in the people around him, he needs the reassurance that his wives are on his side and not on the side of his enemy. Because when you live for 20 years in a world of deceit, you don't know who you can trust. And indeed, when in the continuation of chapter 31, Jacob finally, definitively, conclusively confronts Laban, he emphasized this, this point. In verse 36, Jacob answered and said to Laban, What is my trespass? What is my sin that you hotly pursued after me? In verse 41, These 20 years I have been in your house. I served you 14 years for your two daughters and six years for your flock, and you changed my wages 10 times. Except the God of my father, the God of Abraham, and the fear of Isaac had been on my side. Surely now you would have sent me away empty. God has seen my affliction and the labor of my hands and reproved you yesternight. But this is the world in which, for all these years, Jacob is forced to function. And one can't help but sense that the aftermath of that one act that one act of deceiving his father 
is his being paid back by deceit over and over again over the course of his life. It doesn't end with Laban. Of course, the most harrowing deceit of all, which resulted once again in a kind of internal exile of over two decades, his sons sell their brother, Joseph, into slavery. In Genesis chapter 37, verse 29, Reuben returned to the pit, and behold, Joseph was not in the pit, and he rent his clothes, and he returned to his brethren and said, the child is not, and as for me, where shall I come? What am I going to do? And they took Joseph's coat and slaughtered a he-goat and dipped the coat in blood. And they sent the coat of many colors, the fine woolen coat that Jacob had given his son. And they brought it to their father and said, This have we found. Know now whether it is your son's coat or not. That act of deceit that in so many ways almost killed him. And he knew it and said, It is my son's coat. An evil beast has devoured him. Joseph is without doubt torn in pieces. And Jacob rent his garments and put sackcloth upon his loins and mourned for his son many days. And perhaps the supreme irony, the dreadful irony of this story, besides the deceit of his sons toward him, is... Jacob never really believed them. He was in mourning, but he never really believed that what his sons had said to him actually described Joseph's faith. This becomes clear in Genesis chapter 42, when his sons return to Jacob, to the land of Canaan, and describe everything that happened in the land of Egypt, where they had gone to get food. In verse 30, the man, the Lord of the land, spoke roughly with us and took us for spies of the country. We said we're upright men. We are no spies. We are 12 brethren and sons of our father. One is not, and the youngest is this day with our father in the land of Canaan. And the man, the Lord of the land, said to us, Hereby shall I know that you are upright men. Leave one of your brethren with me, take the corn for the famine of your house, and go your way, and bring your youngest brother unto me. Then shall I know that you are no spies, but that you are upright men. So will I deliver you your brother, and you will traffic in the land. And then, adding, as it were, insult to injury, in verse 35, it came to pass as they emptied their sacks, that behold, every man's bundle of money was in his sack, and when they and their father saw their bundles of money, they were afraid. Now, Freeze. Wouldn't we expect, after such a traumatic experience, what's their father going to say to them? Don't worry, it's not so bad. We'll figure out what to do. Calm down. Don't be so agitated. We might have expected that. Instead, verse 36, and Jacob, their father, said to them, Me, you have bereaved of my children. Joseph is not. Simeon is not and you will take Benjamin away upon me, or all these things come. He's almost explicitly accusing them. Accusing them that Joseph is not. Accusing them that Simeon is not. That I don't really believe what you said about Joseph having been set upon by a wild animal and you found his bloodied coat. I don't believe you telling me that Simeon has been taken captive by this ruler of the land either. And I don't trust you with Benjamin either. I don't trust you at all. And the idea that he didn't trust his own sons becomes explicitly clear in Genesis chapter 45. When after Joseph has finally revealed himself to his brothers, we read, Chapter 45, verse 25 and on, they 
went up out of Egypt and came into the land of Canaan unto Jacob their father, and they told him, Joseph is yet alive, and he's ruler over all the land of Egypt. And how does Jacob respond? And his heart fainted, for he believed them not. Even when the news is good news, he can't bring himself to believe them. Because the truth is, he doesn't really believe anyone. So again, speaking on the plane of crime and punishment, Jacob paid dearly, almost lifelong, for that incident in the tent with Isaac when he presented himself as Esau. From then on, time and again, Jacob is the victim of deceit, and Jacob learns that he really can't trust anyone. Because so often, is he, in the aftermath, deceived in turn. Now this is undoubtedly one dimension of the narrative. Again, the exile that is the direct consequence of Jacob's act, that's explicitly the case, and this additional dimension of repeated acts of deception, of which Jacob is inevitably victim. This is one aspect, but it's by no means the only one. Because were we to simply end on this note, we would clearly be ignoring a critical dimension that the Bible glaringly stresses to us. Indeed, it stresses this point to us, beginning in the narrative itself, in chapter 27, in verse 33, after Esau comes in to Isaac, and Isaac realizes what just happened. Isaac trembled very exceedingly and said, Who then is he who has hunted game and brought it to me, and I have eaten of all before you came and have blessed him? Yea, and he shall be blessed. And he shall be blessed? Why are you blessing him now? Shouldn't you be saying, he shall be cursed? He deceived you. And broadly we could say there are two general directions that we can solicit in trying to understand this extraordinary reaction of Isaac. One is, he shall be blessed. I know he's blessed. Isaac was a prophet. And prophet that he was, he knew blessing stuck. The one who had received that blessing, even though it was on false pretenses, was deemed by God the worthy beneficiary of the blessing. I know he shall be blessed. And alternatively, the other possibility, that Isaac himself at this moment realizes what has taken place. He realizes the deception, and maybe he realizes a great deal more. And Isaac himself concedes, concedes to his wife, to Rebecca, who he undoubtedly realizes immediately is the author of the deception and concedes to Jacob. He shall be blessed. It wasn't my idea, but evidently it was the right idea. And a critical dimension in our appreciating this point beyond what Isaac says here, of all places, to Esau himself, he says, of Jacob, he shall be blessed, is what happens in Genesis 
chapter 28. At the beginning of Genesis chapter 28, immediately following Rebecca telling Isaac, I can't stand the prospect of Jacob marrying the local girls the way Esau did. If he does, I have no reason to go on living. So, in chapter 28, verse 1, Isaac called Jacob and blessed him. Now note, this is not Isaac calling in Esau and mistakenly blessing Jacob. This is not a blessing that was intended for Esau and given to Jacob. It's also not a blessing that was intended for Esau and given to Esau. This is the blessing that's given to Jacob, knowing at the outset that it's Jacob. Isaac called Jacob and blessed him, charged him, said to him, you shall not take a wife of the daughters of Canaan. Arise, go to Padan Aram, to the house of Bethuel, your mother's father, and take your wife from thence of the daughters of Laban, your father's brother. But now we read something extraordinary. And God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful and multiply you that you may be a congregation of peoples and give you the blessing of Abraham to you and to your seed with you that you may inherit the land of your sojournings that God gave unto Abraham. What is so extraordinary in this passage is inevitably with respect to this expression the blessing of Abraham we need to recall where else did we encounter the blessing of Abraham in the entire story here it's a trick question the answer of course is absolutely nowhere the blessing of Abraham was not part of the blessing that Isaac gave to Esau. It was not part of the blessing that Isaac gave to Jacob thinking he was blessing Esau. The only place that Isaac mentions the blessing of Abraham, which includes inheriting the land of your sojournings, the land of Canaan, the land of Israel, is here when he knowingly blesses Jacob. Consider this well. The blessing of Abraham and the promise to inherit the land that God gave Abraham is a spiritual blessing. It is to become the spiritual heir of Abraham and Isaac. And Isaac evidently never even entertained the idea of giving that blessing to anyone other than Jacob. He only mentions it here. He never even considered giving that blessing to Esau. Doesn't mention it in the first blessing that he gave to Jacob thinking it was Esau. Doesn't mention it in the second blessing that he gave to Esau. He only mentions it here. There was never a question as to who the spiritual heir of Abraham is and it didn't become any more of a question because of the manner in which, admittedly, deceitfully, Jacob took the blessing that was initially intended to Esau, which isn't a spiritual blessing at all. It's a material blessing. Just consider what the content of that blessing is that was, at the outset, intended for Esau. God give you of the dew of heaven and of the fat places of the earth and plenty of corn and wine. Let people serve you. Let nations bow to you. It's completely material. The spiritual blessing from the beginning was always intended to be the blessing that goes specifically to Jacob. And of course, inevitably, we recognize that this isn't something that pertains only to the manner in which Isaac perceives the situation. Well, that Rebecca, Rebecca saw it that way, goes to that saying. But evidently, so does God. In the continuation of Genesis chapter 28, when 
Jacob went out of Beersheba and went toward Haran. He lighted upon the place and tarried there all night because the sun was set and dreamed. In Genesis chapter 28, verse 12 and on, he dreamed and behold, a ladder set up on the earth and the top of it reached to heaven and behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. And behold, God stood over him and said, I am God, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land whereon you lie, to you will I give it, and to your seed. And your seed will be as the dust of the earth, and you shall spread out to the west, and to the east, and to the north, and to the south. And in you, and in your seed, shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And behold, I am with you, and will keep you whithersoever you go, and will bring you back into this land. For I will not leave you until I have done that which I have spoken concerning you. This is not blessing. It should be treated frivolously, certainly not merely material. It is indeed Jacob's inaugural prophecy. I think it's clear to all of us that someone who is merely assessed as a deceiver is not going to be privy to a prophecy such as this. Indeed, the prophecy altogether. And of course, this is not the only prophecy that Jacob experiences. In Genesis chapter 31, when Jacob relates to Rachel and Leah what he has experienced, he tells them, in verses 11, 12, and 13, the angel of God said to me in the dream, Jacob, and I said, here I am. And he said, lift up now your eyes and see all the he goats that leap upon the flock are streaked, speckled, and grizzled. For I have seen all that Laban does to you. I am the God of Bethel, where you did anoint a pillar, where you did vow a vow unto me. Now arise, get you out of this land and return to the land of your birth. These two, even after over two decades in the house of Laban, it's confirmation that Jacob remains God's chosen, God's blessed. And on his way back home to the land of Israel, this is further confirmed by the angel with whom Jacob fights. In chapter 32, verse 29, and he said, Your name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. For you have striven with godly beings, with angels of God, and with men, and have prevailed. And he blessed them there. And Jacob himself recognizes, in naming the place Peniel, I have seen, we can read the verse as referring to either God or an angel, face to face, and my life is preserved. And of course, it's not only the angel upon Jacob's return to land who confirms this change in Jacob's identity and name. It is, after all, God himself. In Genesis chapter 35, verse 9 and on, And God appeared unto Jacob again when he came from Padan Aram and blessed him. And God said to him, Your name Jacob, your name shall not be called anymore Jacob, but Israel shall be your name. And he called his name Israel. And God said to him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall be of you, and kings will come out of your loins. And the land that I gave unto Abraham and Isaac, to you I will give it. And to your seed after you will I give the land. And yet, once again, when so many years later, Jacob is poised once again to hit the road, descending to Egypt, in Genesis chapter 46, in verse 2, And God spoke unto Israel in the visions of the night, and said, Jacob, Jacob, and he said, Here I am. And he said, I am God, 
the God of your father. Fear not to go down into Egypt, for I will there make of you a great nation. I will go down with you into Egypt, and I will also surely bring you up again. And this truly becomes, indeed, the identity of Jacob. Wherever he goes, he never walks alone. God is with him. This is not the fate of one who makes oneself into a deceiver. God indeed remains with Jacob. Because on some plane, what inevitably we need to appreciate here is while the course upon which Rebecca practically dragged Jacob is not an ordinary course, and it certainly wasn't a pleasant course. It wasn't exactly a course of deceit either. Once we recognize that the question with which Rebecca in particular is grappling is what do we need to do to properly equip the spiritual heir of Abraham and Isaac. And here inevitably we need to consider what we already know, not only about Jacob, but also about Esau. And this brings us back to Genesis chapter 25, where we read, beginning in verse 27, the boys grew and Esau was a cunning hunter, a man of the field. And Jacob was quiet, simple, single-minded man dwelling in tents. Note, who is described as cunning here? Who has the shrewdness? It's not Jacob. Jacob is simple, single-minded, unsophisticated. In contrast, Esau is the hunter. A hunter always needs to be sophisticated. After all, the hunter will never be successful if he isn't able to outsmart his quarry. But the hunter's mission, inevitably, is one of deception. When he goes out into the field or into the woods, he needs to ensure that the animals won't be the wiser that he's there to ensnare them. Now, bearing this in mind, when we consider what happens in the continuation of Genesis chapter 25. In verse 29, Jacob sawed pottage, and Esau came in from the field, and he was faint. And Esau said to Jacob, let me swallow, I pray you, some of this red redness. He's attracted by the color. Maybe the color reminds him of his favorite vocation spilling the blood of his animal victims. Indeed, therefore he called his name Red. And Jacob said, sell me as of this day your birthright. And Esau said, behold, I'm at the point to die. What profit shall the birthright do to me? And Jacob said, swear to me as of this day, and he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Now, if we wouldn't appreciate that the one who was the cunning hunter was Esau, and that Jacob was the one who was simple, single-minded, we might think that Jacob outsmired Esau. But then, upon reflection, we realize nothing could be further from the truth. From Esau's perspective, Unequivocally, he outsmarted Jacob. Jacob, for this ethereal birthright that to Esau is utterly meaningless, was foolish enough to part with a good hearty bowl of soup. And that this indeed is what takes place, becomes clear when we read the summation of the narrative in verse 34. And Jacob gave Esau bread and pottage of lentils, 
and he did eat and drink and rose up and went his way. So far, simply recording the narrative. So Esau despised the birthright. Note, despised. That's being contemptuous. That's disdaining. That's regarding the birthright, which is, after all, precisely what we've been discussing. Being the spiritual heir of his father. Esau has no interest in it. Sure, he wants the blessing. He wants the blessing because he indeed understands very well the blessing is the promise of material bounty. But birthright, being spiritual heir, it never made a difference to him. Consider in Genesis chapter 27 the way Esau bemoans having been deceived. And he said, is not he rightly named Jacob? For he has supplanted me these two times. He took away my birthright, and behold, now he's taken away my blessing. And in our tradition, Isaac perks up when he hears this, and he says, what? He took away your birthright? Not just the blessing? Oh, what a relief. I thought... I had been deceived into giving the blessing that had been intended for the firstborn, the possessor of the birthright, to the younger brother. But now, see, everything is fine. The blessing that I gave, indeed, the mark, the blessing that I gave was to the one who had indeed rightly earned the birthright that you, Esau, so flippantly disdained and despised. And that this indeed informs our understanding of Esau's identity is driven home time and again in what we read in Genesis. Just consider what we read immediately before Genesis chapter 27, the last two verses in chapter 26. When Esau was 40 years old, he took to wife Judith, the daughter of Beri the Hittite, and Basamath, the daughter of Elon the Hittite. Ironic, isn't it? We read explicitly that Isaac married Rebekah when he was 40 years old, but then uh, Esau's wives were, to put it mildly, no Rebekah. And they were a bitterness of spirit unto Isaac and to Rebekah. They were a bitterness of spirit because they continued in their pagan, idolatrous, depraved ways. Didn't bother Esau at all. But it was a cause of misery to his parents. And that this is indeed the identity of Esau at heart becomes inherently clear when we consider how Esau reacts to Jacob getting the blessing. We have a saying in our tradition that a person can be appropriately discerned by how he gets angry. In chapter 27, verse 41, Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing wherewith his father blessed him. Well, on some plane, you can't blame him for being upset, but... Esau said in his heart, let the days of mourning for my father be at hand and I will slay my brother Jacob. You're going to kill him over blessing? And what exactly do you think you're going to accomplish? Do you think God is going to bless you because you have made yourself into a murderer and committed fratricide? But evidently that's not a question that the likes of Esau ask. So far as he's concerned, committing an act of murder is perfectly reasonable. Remember the blessing that Isaac gave him about living by the sword. And straight through to the end of the passage, we see the same Esau. In chapter 28, when Isaac sends Jacob away, to seek a wife not from the daughters of Canaan. Esau's reaction in verses 8 and 9 is 
he saw the daughters of Canaan, please not Isaac, his father. So Esau went to Ishmael and took unto the wives he had, Machalath, the daughter of Ishmael, Abraham's son, the sister of Nehoyot, to be his wife. You know what? Unto the wives he already had. If these wives were bitterness of spirit for Isaac and Rebekah, what could he possibly have thought he would achieve by maintaining them and then just adding an additional wife to them? They're still the same bitterness of spirit. They're still the same pagans. They still live by the same code of depravity and immorality. But for Esau, that's fine. That's exactly the point. So ultimately, when we ask ourselves, who is Esau and who is Jacob? And what then? Rebecca is compelled to do in order to ensure that the spiritual legacy of Abraham continues into the next generation. Inevitably, we consider the identity of Esau. And maybe in this vein, going far beyond the scope of the book of Genesis, it will do us well to consider the words of the last of the prophets, Malachi, at the beginning of chapter 1. The burden of the word of God to Israel by Malachi. I have loved you, says God. Yet you say, wherein have you loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, says God? Yet I loved Jacob. But Esau, I hated, and made his mountains a desolation and gave his heritage to the jackals of the wilderness. Whereas Edom, Edom, of course, as we already know, is Esau, said, we are beaten down, but we will return and build the waste places. Thus says the God of hosts, they shall build and I will throw down, and they will be called the border of wickedness and the people whom God execrates forever. And this inevitably directs us to appreciating perhaps the deepest point of all that pertains to this blessing and this apparent act of deception. Inevitably, we need to ask ourselves, what is truth? And how do you acquire it? What is truth? In the sense that you might, of course, make a superficial equation that truth is what is historically factual. We have a different definition. Truth is what is defined by God. In Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 10, the prophet says, but the Lord God is truth. He is truth. God defines truth. And it isn't simply a matter of a superficial correspondence to historical, factual accuracy. It's much more subtle than that. To take an example that I think well illustrates the point, you'll note that in Genesis chapter 18, recall when the angels come to Abraham and Sarah, and there is the promise in verse 10, I will certainly return unto you when the season comes around, and lo, Sarah, your wife, will have a son. And Sarah hears, and we read in verse 11, Abraham and Sarah were old, well-stricken in age, and it ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. Verse 12, and Sarah laughed within herself, saying, after I am waxed old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord, being old? Verse 13, and God says to Abraham, Wherefore did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I have a surety bear a child? I, who am old. Oh, wait a second. That's not what Sarah said. 
to be very precise, she did indeed say, after I am waxed old, shall I have pleasure? But the stress was my Lord being old. My Lord being old, of course, referring to her husband, Abraham. So why does God paraphrase Sarah's words as, shall I have a surety bear a child, I who am old? And of course the obvious answer is because God is speaking with Abraham. And God obviously realizes the inevitable that there could be a certain amount of friction, of ill will generated by telling Abraham that Sarah said, how am I going to have children? My husband is so old. So God recasts the statement. It's not categorically false, but it certainly is not a precisely historically accurate statement and says, Sarah's words were, shall I have a surety bear a child, I who am old. And from this in our tradition, we learn a crucial principle, a principle that has the approbation of God's act himself. And that is, it is permissible in times it is mandatory to modify for the sake of shalom, for the sake of peace. Peace is a critically important value. And for the sake of peace, God teaches us, you don't say to Abraham, Sarah said you're old. Sure, that would be historically accurate. So what? It is going to generate ill will. It's going to hurt Abraham's feelings. It is going to result in a quarrel, in a lack of felicity between Abraham and Sarah. It might be historically accurate, but it is the greatest lie imaginable. God is truth. And from God we learn what real truth is necessarily is. We don't establish merely some facile equation between historical accuracy and truth, and conversely, inaccuracy and deception. Sure, that's true on one level, but there are deeper levels. And when we get at those deeper levels, we realize what Rebecca summons Jacob to do is to embrace what really is a deeper truth. If you know what Esau is, and you realize that the one who is living in a state of deception is Isaac because he doesn't realize it sufficiently. Because even if Isaac recognizes that his spiritual heir is Jacob, he thinks that perhaps in order to further Jacob's spiritual mission, the material bounty should go to Esau. You need Rebecca engaging in what superficially is an act of deception in order to eliminate that deception in order to drive home with relentless clarity to Isaac that not only is Jacob the spiritual heir, Jacob personifies the one who needs to receive all of Isaac's blessings, spiritual as well as material. So, on the one hand, Jacob does, as we saw, pay very, very dearly for having engaged in what, on a superficial plane, is deception. No denying that. But on a deeper plane, what makes Jacob, Jacob, is precisely that unswerving fidelity to that deeper truth. That deeper truth, because God is truth. The deeper truth that is so aptly expressed in the closing words of the prophet Micha. 
you will give truth to Jacob. You give truth to Jacob in Micah chapter 7, verse 20, the last verse of his prophecy. Because through what Jacob does, what he truly is embracing, really, is the truth. The truth that God is the truth. The truth that makes Jacob the spiritual heir in every way of Abraham and Isaac, even of the material bounty. The truth that indeed makes Jacob worthy of blessing. God bless you.